morning. Hymn number 40, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Hymn number 40. Lift it up together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusted in His grace this time? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? watch some of the old shows. I was watching Little House of the Prairie this last week. And they were the good old Reverend Alden, y'all remember him. They weren't quite Baptists on that show. And he was talking about how uh, I think one of the little girls was getting christened or something like that, right? Oh, how, you know, this, the water of the baptism will wash her sins away. No, sorry, Reverend Alden, you're wrong. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes our sins away, amen. The water of the baptism doesn't do that. Pastor said this many times, if it did, man, he'd have to clean that thing out before he even got out. Because it'd be super filthy from his sin. Right? Hey, it's not that way. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, and we don't have to have it reapplied. It's there for all eternity, amen. Aren't you glad for that? Lift it up on that second verse together, him. Put a smile on your face this morning. Lift it up on that third. When the this morning with a yes amen and if you can't hey we can help you understand how you can know for sure you can have your sins washed away in the blood of the lamb it was great to see you this morning good to have everyone here this morning and looking forward to a great day in the lord's house brother hood would you open us in a word of prayer this morning <coughs> seated there. It sure is good to see you uh, this morning and uh, glad to see some folks returning uh, for some time off from uh, illness and you know, vacation by getting the flu. That's not a way to take a vacation, right? And uh, so and others are getting, getting better, recovering from surgeries and so on and so forth and so we rejoice in that. But we are so glad to see you this morning and not only glad to see you, but I'm glad, I'm personally glad to see the snow gone. And uh, it's, hey, it's pretty when it comes, but get on out of here, okay? We saw you, you came, and that's one of the joys of living
living in Texas. We see it snow for about 12 hours and then goodbye, had enough. 60 degrees, here we come. I think by, set, by Wednesday, 70 degrees. You don't like that, Emma? And uh, you wanted the snow to stick around a little bit longer? Yeah, no, nah, I don't. And uh, so, uh, hey, freeze the stuff, kill the bugs and the bacteria, and then get to the warm weather again. And so, uh, but we're grateful for uh, the opportunity to be here this morning and glad, glad to see you. Let me give you just a few announcements, kind of let you know uh, some things coming up uh, right around the corner. The uh, Church Planner Conference will begin on Tuesday, and for those of you that are interested, you can go online. There's a, uh, a link uh, in your bulletin there. You can go online and, and watch the Church Planner Conference. And uh, so some of you are maybe new here and say, what is this Church Planner Conference? Well, at the Heartland Baptist Bible College, uh, they, there's an emphasis not only on missions, but also on planting churches in America. Hundreds, if not thousands of churches close every year in our nation. Churches in small towns. Churches in big cities. Churches that are in great debt. Churches, imagine this, church is out of debt, have a building, have a location, but no pastor and no people, and the church dies. Happens all the time. What do we do, pastor? Hey, we've got a strengthened church planning in America. Anybody ever notice as you drive through, uh, even in small towns, there's a First Baptist Church everywhere. You ever notice that? You ever wonder, why, why are there so many First Baptist churches? I mean, you can't all be first. And the reason being, hey, listen, in the 1800s, the Southern Baptists, they understood the necessity of, of church planting, and they sent out people from their churches into every town to start churches. And it was the First Baptist Church in that town, not First Baptist as in we are, the number, we are number one, but it was the First Baptist Church to be established in that town. And they all became known as First Baptist. And, hey, listen, they understood the need for church. Now, many times they did it thinking they were going to usher in the kingdom. Can I say, you're not going to usher in the kingdom. The kingdom's going to come whether you usher it in or not, right? Jesus Christ is not waiting for you and I to meet him at the door and show him where to sit. He knows exactly where he's seated. He knows exactly when he's coming. You're not going to usher in the kingdom, but there is a necessity to get churches started for when the kingdom comes. You understand when Jesus Christ comes back? Hey, listen, for many, eternity will be sealed. You're either going to heaven or hell. The end. So what do we do? We need to get the gospel out as, as much as possible. So this church planner conference uh, has been established uh, many years ago and hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, upwards of five hundred dollars or $600,000 or more usually are, is given by churches all across America. Churches come from, from Washington State, from California, Arizona, up in Wyoming and Idaho and those areas. Hey, churches come from Maine and, and e even churches like over in the Boston area. Can you believe there might be somebody out there that knows the truth? And uh, so Hey, over in that, in the, in the East Coast, there's churches that come down, down south in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, Florida and Georgia and Mississippi. I mean, churches come from all over the nation, and we congregate together. Pastors would come, and many times uh, others come, and, and, and for the sole purpose of, of praying and seeking the Lord's will uh, to decide, hey, listen, how can we disperse these funds to help churches established throughout our nation? And so I remember uh, a few years ago there was a, a fellow there. He was Haitian. He, he, he uh, was a refugee, came into the Miami area in, in Florida there and, uh, and got saved. Somebody gave him the gospel, and he got saved, and he was trained, and, and, and then he had a desire to reach his own people. Would you believe that in the Miami area there's a lot of Haitians? Surprise, surprise, right? He wanted to reach his own people. Listen, our, my folks are dying and going to hell. And so he went and, and, and established a church for the Haitian people. Many of the people coming to his church were, were refugees. They didn't have money. They didn't have anything. And so for 20 years, they had, with just a small group of people, they rented a place and they set up chairs and they set up a sound system and they, they set up church and they took it down every Sunday every Wednesday for 20 years. Can you imagine, hey church, we need you to come help us every week. I mean, many of you work for food day. Do that every Sunday. Every Sunday in order to have church. Set up chairs, take down chairs, set up the sound system. Brother Chad, you can't just leave it there. You gotta reset it and sure, sure enough, as you move your sound system, somebody done turn the knobs, right? Every Sunday for 20 years. Hey, God opened up an opportunity for them to buy this garage. He had pictures of it. it uh, many of you would not put your car in this garage. But it was a place where they could buy it, call their own, set up, and establish the, uh, a Haitian church for the first time. I remember giving towards that and saying, hey, Lord, let's help this church 
establish a permanent location that way they may reach people imagine that the church planter came from New York City there was a uh, yeah New York City that area and uh, so and uh, hey don't get your salsa from New York City right and uh, so hey listen came from New York City and uh, and there there was a, uh, a church that was a uh, landmark uh, in the community uh, for for many years I believe if I re recollect correctly it was in the Bronx area and uh, Anyways, while, while it was there, they were looking at, there was a small group of people that were meeting there, but the city had already written them and says, we're going to condemn the building unless you do these repairs. The building was in such disrepair that, that they said, we're just going to condemn it, needing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work. A little church there meeting. Property's not cheap in that area. Can you imagine? Nobody just says, hey, you want to start a church? Here, come take this. So not only you got a church that's about to close, a, a, a church building that's been there from the 1800s about to be demolished so they can build some kind of other building there, maybe a mosque, right? Church planner came and said, if we can raise some funds, the city says if we can get these repairs done, they'll let us keep it. In one service, we raised the funds. They did the work. I, I believe uh, uh, Brother Montoro has a, a video of that, and, and uh, I think the, the scaffolding alone to do the renovation was $90,000. That's what scaffolding, yeah. Yeah, it, and it was, it, yeah, it's just outright. That's just to rent it, by the way, not to purchase it. By the time it's said and done, the church is established. People went and, and helped. Hey, what, what are we doing in this church? We're doing that. We're trying to, hey, listen, establish. Hey, listen, Christianity is not done in America. No. And not, listen, not on our watch. We're not. We're gonna. We're gonna build churches. And by the way, the churches that we invest in are churches of like faith. They're gonna preach the King James Bible. Okay. Yeah. They're gonna. Hey, they're gonna take the Word of God and, and preach the truth out of it. The same doctrines. Hey, they, they might have the right Bible and wrong doctrines. You know, teach this Calvinism that, listen, God pick and chose who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. You have no choice. Listen, we're not going to invest in a church like that because that's heresy. Hey, listen, we're not going to invest in a church that preaches a, in a mid-trib or post-trib rapture. That's heresy. We're not going to invest in a church that teaches heresy. We're going to invest in a church that teaches the truth. And, uh, and so we invest in these churches. And so, hey, if you'd like to watch those, hey, a lot of good preaching going on, but also the, uh, the giving. And, and, and listen, maybe burn your heart for the need of churches across America. You can log into that and take a look at it there. Uh, the, the link, again, is in the bulletin. Teenagers, don't forget the youth rally on the 18th. And the details are also in the bulletin. Be, be ready to uh, bring home the trophy, right? And Jonathan, you ready for that? Bring home the trophy, and so our guys won the trophy as far as we are aware. And, uh, you know, unless something happened that we don't know of or whatever else, we, we, we plan on bringing home the trophy. And uh, so, hey, let's do it again this year, and uh, looking forward to that. And, uh, hey, also January 22nd, we'll have our election of church officers. And let me say that uh, for those of you, maybe you've been out for a while and, and you're not sure, you didn't realize, your name has been nominated for a uh, church officer position for a trustee or assistant treasurer or a church clerk. Uh, you say, where is that list? It's in the kitchen, and if you feel like you're not going to be able to fulfill those obligations for the, for that um, uh, for that position, hey, trustees, we're, uh, we would meet with you uh, various times, but uh, specifically, uh, if you notice here, uh, the uh, no, it's not on here. Yes. Uh, on the 24th, we'll have to meet with you at 7 o'clock there to, uh, to go over uh, with the trustees and, and treasurers a budget meeting, and then we'll have our annual church budget meeting on the 29th. Uh, but other times, time, from time to time, we'll meet with you uh, about things that need to be done. Hey, uh, treasurers, hey, every service, somebody's got to count the funds and make the deposit and put all that in. And so uh, so for our assistant treasurers being voted in, you got you got to stay late after church. And you're like, but but what? But I, but I, uh, no, no, listen, that's part of the responsibility. So if you don't think you'll be able to, to fulfill those responsibilities, if you'll mark your name off, by the way, the church clerk needs you here every service. You said, why is that? Because from time to time we vote on something and need you to take those notes and who, who made the, the motion and who made the second and, the, and whether or not the vote was, uh, you know, from time to time we, we have those things that go on. And so need you to take those notes so we can have it listed down. And so, uh, 
uh, all that information there. Again, if you, if you feel you can't fulfill those obligations, just gently mark your name out, initial next to it, so I know it was you that did it and not somebody else, and, uh, and we'll take your name off that nomination form, and then church together, we will have a closed ballot election on January 22nd, that is a Wednesday night, uh, at the end of the service. And so we say, well, Pastor, why do you do it at the end? Because I don't want somebody to wonder if I, if I won. And by the way, you don't need to run a campaign to win. Don't print buttons and shirts and, uh, and have signs out here and, and you know, and uh, just make phone calls and... I'm running for church clerk, and, uh, you know, you don't have to do all that. And uh, so, hey, listen, but be in prayer. Uh, you know, all, all joking aside, be in prayer, church. We just want, we want God's direction on those things. And uh, as we vote in those officers uh, for, to, to assist us as a church. Uh, so just want to let you know those things coming up right around the corner. Looking forward to those activities. And, and again, if you don't realize your name is on the, ballot, uh, on the, uh, the nomination form and you don't mark your name off, you may show up here on Wednesday night, January 22nd, and look down to vote, and you're about to say, my name is still on there. Guess what? Your name is on there now. And so uh, you say, Pastor, what, is it, what does someone have to do to get their name on there? You have to be a, uh, a faithful member. You have to be a tithing, and you have to be a member. That helps too, right? And uh, so not, you have to be a member of the church, but mem a faithful tithing member of the church, and, uh, and then you can nominate. And if you still like to nominate somebody, <coughs> just grab a nomination form, drop it in the offering plate, uh, any offering, and we'll get that added to the list. Well, let's see if it's going to sing some Amen. Take your hymn book, hymn number 41. Hymn 41, there is a fountain.
think about lying silent in the grave of one the scripture says he being dead yet he speaketh how does he do that from the grave well, he is a testimony that goes beyond death right so though my body may lay silent in the grave my prayer is that I live a life in such a way that though I'm gone what I try to proclaim to others continues to live and the good news is even if I die the truth doesn't the scripture still holds true does it not Amen. and so thank the Lord for that but grateful for the blood of Christ are you glad to be saved tonight Amen. How about this morning? Yes, this afternoon? Yes, Tomorrow? Y'all yes, got quieter as you kind of went through. And at first, yeah, hey, uh, wait, I don't know if I'm happier about it or not. And uh, hey, there's nothing like being saved and knowing for sure heaven's your home. And, and knowing, listen, no matter what happens in life, I'm in God's hands. And uh, thank the Lord for that. And so uh, part of our offering, that's what it's about, is acknowledging what God has done for us. And uh, you can't buy salvation. You can put a million dollars in the offering plate every service. I didn't say every week, every service, and still die and go to hell. Because you can't buy salvation. It's a free gift given to all those who would just put their faith and trust in him. Turn to him in repentance and, and, and allow Jesus Christ to, to be the, the, the payment for your sins. And I'm glad he doesn't have to do it again. You know, he doesn't have to suffer every time a sinner comes to him. He, he suffered one time, and it was enough. It satisfied the Father. And uh, for all those that call upon him, so we're grateful for that. Well, as we pray and ask for his blessings upon the offering, uh, Brother Hood, would you ask the Lord to bless for us today? Amen. <laughs> Hymn number two. Hymn number two. Before pastor comes, hymn number two. When we see Christ. <laughs>
second. that day lifted up all together on the last If you're ready to see the Lord this morning, boy, how many will not be ready because they don't understand the benefit of knowing the Lord? And uh, just think about one of these days when uh, when life is over. Right now, you're you're excited about tomorrow because tomorrow's Monday. Everybody loves Mondays, don't they? And, uh, you, hey, you're excited about tomorrow. Hey, you're ready to go to work. You're ready to make money so you can pay the bills. And, uh, hey, one person said, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Well, that's something to just look forward to, right? Yeah. Just eat, drink, be merry. That's it. I mean, the yeah, only thing in life is food and sleep. To some people, that's all they care about. But you understand that there's so much more to life than just food and and intake, right? And it's not just uh, eat, drink, be merry, hey, all that stuff. Hey, you know what? There is a, a life worth having. And we rejoice that it's in Jesus Christ. And there's also a future worth looking forward to. Two of you agree now. Okay, you're thinking about it. And uh, 
The future is not 2020, 2021, or 2022. And the future is in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, hey, in that day, because just imagine all eternity. Uh, you say, what are we going to be doing through all eternity? You know, I don't know every detail. The scripture doesn't tell us all the things we're going to be doing, but I know it'll be good. And uh, I, I just imagine for a moment the angelic choir. Uh, I love to hear singing, but can you imagine hearing the angels who are always on pitch? Right? And uh, hey, you ever been there when Brother Seifert's leading and he holds that hand way up there and you're like, oh, I didn't get a big enough breath. <sighs> Uh, I didn't end, uh, right? And hey, you understand, uh, listen, it, how wonderful it's going to sound. Uh, I, like, just imagine that time. I, I don't know how the Lord's going to do it or if He'll do it, but imagine when, for, for a moment when all of those around uh, uh, the throne, the saved of all eternity, begin to sing out the praises and the glory of God. Not just the angels who don't understand, but mankind who was saved and blood bought begin to sing the praises of God. Imagine what that's going to sound like when we pour our hearts into those, those songs. And uh, listen, what a day that would be. And can you imagine what it will be like when you have the opportunity to see Jesus Christ face to face for the first time? Now, I know some people, they're so critical when they see Jesus face to face. They'll say, you don't look anything like I thought you'd look. <laughs> they will be disappointed. And uh, listen, there's nothing to be critical about when it comes to the Lord, uh, how wonderful it will be. And so we rejoice in that opportunity. Are you saved this morning? And uh, by way of testimony, many of you have been here uh, a great number of times and you've even uh, mentioned and or whether you were here when you got saved or uh, we were around or heard your testimony about it by way of testimony, the great number of folks here uh, are saved and we're grateful for that. So I want you to think about how'd you get saved? Off times our mind goes when I think, how did I get saved? We begin to think about, well, you know what? There was that day for me, it was March 15th night, and we go into those details, right? And I was here and I was there, and here's the event surrounding. No, 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 I don't mean how did you get saved and, and, and how did the event transpire, but how did you get saved? Well, I don't know, Pastor, what, what, what exactly are you looking for? You understand that without the grace of God, none of us would have gotten saved. It's by God's grace. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, right? As Paul the Apostle, he, he many times would reminisce about his salvation experience on that road to Damascus. And, and listen, there are times when he, writing to his epistles to the churches, he didn't go into the details. He didn't, uh, as he did in the book of Acts, three times gave his testimony of how he got saved. And these epistles, he would say, listen, for by God's grace are you saved, right? For by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But aren't you glad the grace of God isn't just to save you? God's grace goes beyond even salvation. And I want you to think about that with me for a moment, the grace of God. And it's not just grace that sits there. It's, it, it's not as an, uh, an, an object. Let me find a good object here. Here we go. Well, no, change my mind. If you're not here on Wednesday nights, you won't understand. It's not an object. You just sit there. Well, there's the grace of God. How wonderful it is. But I'm glad that the grace of God is an acting grace. It's doing something. It's the working grace of God. This hatchet or machete. I remember when I bought it, we had just about lost two daughters to a creek. Creek. <laughs> no, if it was a creep... I wouldn't, well, I mean, if I had this, I'd use this, but I have other tools that I would probably use for the creep. <laughs> we bought, lost two daughters to the creek on a kayak, did lose one kayak. We stashed two kayaks up in the hills, and the girls were like, you think anybody's going to steal them? Yeah, how many people are going down a creek looking up into the hills to see if there's by chance a kayak stashed up there? I so said, I think they're, they're going to be okay. And we walked out and uh, we had lost our shoes and lost, I mean, it was bad. And uh, flip flops and, you know, everything else because we we're barefoot. I mean, it, it was horrible. Well, we have our life vest to protect us from the mosquitoes. And so when Trey and I, <laughs> yeah, when Trey and I went back to recover our, our, our kayaks, I bought the machete because I knew I had to hack through some of those thorns and thistles. You know what? The machete is not going to do anything sitting there on the shelf, but when it's acting, when it's doing something, when it's working, 
it makes an impact in my life. And the God, God's grace is not just an object that sits there. It's doing something. Titus chapter 2, if you found your place there, we're going to look at, well, what, is, what do you mean, Pastor? What do you mean the grace of God is doing something? Well, I'm glad I didn't just have to come with it on my own. I'm glad God tells us what it's doing in His Word, right? Uh, my intellect is not so superior that I know all the details of what God's doing and what His grace is doing without Him helping me to know what it's doing. Titus chapter 2, if you found your place there, we're going to begin reading here. And uh, we're going to start in verse 1 uh, for a moment and get some context of the Scripture. It's okay for those who are not used to our Wednesday night services, I'll put the machete away. Notice what the Scripture says, Titus chapter 2, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober. Again, that word sober is not talking about you're just supposed to not be drunk when you come to church. Hey, be serious. The aged men, hey, listen, uh, for those of us that have some life experience behind us, hey, we, we ought to be able to be serious when it's time to be serious. Be grave, be temperate, sound in faith. Here's one that men we struggle with in charity. It's all right, one of you can say amen there. Come on, men. Gives, giving love, right, in patience. Oh, we relate to that a little bit more, huh? <laughs> yeah. But then he says, not just, hey, listen, example or, or, or some instruction for the aged men. Hey, for the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Ladies, there's... By the way, listen, God created man, God created woman. God knows the tendencies of man, God knows the tendencies of women. And he says, listen, to our aged women, to our ladies here, hey, listen, you ought to be, have a type of behavior that, that resembles holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Now, we, there's a lot of details in here we could spend a lot of time studying, but we don't have time for that today. But teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Let me just say in a nutshell, if our men and women would live the way God said, our homes would be what God had intended, and folks would not say, well, I don't need your God. You know what they would say? I need your God because your home is so much different than my home. Just, just kind of laying it out there. And he says, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, a sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. He had a lot to say to the ladies. One verse to say to, wit, to men. You say, why is that? Because men aren't listening anyways. <laughs> is that better, Miss Brenda? Better than Sunday school? Okay, good, good, good. Look at verse 9. Exhort servants. Now we're going to go not just the men, not just the women, but those that are serving. Hey, today, well, we don't have servants and slaves. Do, do you work a job? Then you're serving somebody. Now, they may not have you in bondage. You can, we have, we, thank God we live in Texas, the right to work state. That's not the right, if you want to work, you can. But listen, if you want to quit your job and go somewhere else, you can. Right? If you don't like your job, go work somewhere else. Be careful, the grass is not always greener on the other side. And it's always the greenest over the septic tank. But servants, hey, listen, to be obedient to their own masters. Hey, listen, employees ought to be obedient to their employers, if you will. And please them well in all things, not answering again. You don't need to talk back. Right about how the sermon, you know, the text, you're going, man, this is, this is good. Man, thank God for the grace of God. Right, uh, right now you were going, I need God's grace. <laughs> don't you? Not purloining. That uh, word poor learning, if you, if you look it up, uh, often it'll talk about stealing, but it goes beyond just taking something that's not yours. It is, even goes into embezzlement. Well, pastor, I'm not embezzling. Are you stealing time that's not yours? For when you clock in, you now have obligated yourself to a responsibility to do a job you said you would do. 
not at the water cooler. It got real quiet there, didn't it? This is the responsibility of employees who call themselves Christians on the workplace. Not purloining, not stealing, not, not, not uh, expecting pay for you just sloughing off on the job, but showing uh, all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God and Savior in all things. You ought to set an example in the workplace that folks would say, I want to hire Christians. How many employers have I said, I wouldn't hire a Christian at all? God forbid. Look at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. By the way, for those that say that Jesus is not God, take a look at that, our great God and our Savior. He's not talking about two individuals that are going to show up. Who's showing up in the clouds? God's not showing up and Jesus. Hey, Jesus is going to show up in the clouds. He is our great God and our great Savior who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. The working grace of God. Lord, I pray you'd help us today as we examine your word and Lord, these words that were given to Titus, may they be words that would challenge us and Lord, those of us who declare ourselves to be Christians, God, may it make a, a, a lasting effect in our hearts and lives. May we acknowledge your grace this morning and Lord, allow it to do that which you've intended for it to do. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. The working grace of God. Titus was a young man in the faith, if you will. That's what Paul would call him. Titus, many of us have heard of Timothy, Paul's preacher boy, that, that God uh, had allowed Paul to invest into his life. Some of you have heard of 2 Timothy, that Paul was able to invest in his life. Okay, there's a joke there. And uh, some of you got it, some of you didn't. And so, hey, no, so we have Timothy was a young preacher boy. Paul would invest in his life, teach and train him for the gospel ministry. Titus also was a preacher boy, and, and, and Paul would invest in his life and teach him and, and train him how to, uh, how to fulfill the responsibilities of a pastor as Paul went on his missionary journeys establishing churches and trying to get the gospel spread around the world. As Paul would write back to Titus, and we don't have time to go into all the details this morning, he, he lists the, the, this little epistle here uh, written before uh, in the canon of Scripture before our book of Hebrews. And listen, as he would write this uh, uh, epistle, he would give Titus not only some instruction on uh, what's required for a pastor, but he would also give instruction of what's required of a Christian. Oftentimes times we think of Titus and, and even in, as Paul would write to Timothy and we would see in there the, the, the qualifications of a pastor. But if you will for a moment, right after the qualifications of the pastor in chapter 1, how about he lists some qualifications of a Christian? Think about that for a moment. The qualifi Well, pastor, I didn't think I had qualifications. You understand before a pastor could be a, a good pastor, he first must be a good Christian. If he's not a good Christian, he shouldn't be a pastor. Right? But then again, when we say good, what are we comparing it to? For then none of us are. He speaks of this sound doctrine. He says, listen, if, if you look here again in verse 1, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Notice there's a colon there. And Paul's going to continue this thought, this sound doctrine, these truths. Listen, here's some things that you ought to be teaching in your church. You ought to be teaching the aged men how they're supposed to be living. You ought to be teaching the aged women how they're supposed to be living. And by the way, as the pastor, here Titus, as the pastor, you're to teach others this stuff. But guess what? Not just you as pastor teaching others. Hey, the aged men Men ought to be teaching the younger men and the aged women ought to teach the younger women. Listen, it goes from one to the next to the next. We're not to teach that way we can just keep to ourselves. We're to teach others so that they can also give it to the younger. 
It goes for men. It goes for women. It goes for our children. Hey, it goes for those that, uh, that are in the workplace. And might I say, thank God we have a different parameter of work, uh, uh, work today. We don't have servants and masters per se, but we do have employees and employers. And that same principles apply. As we begin to examine for a moment, chapter 2, many of us may say, well, I've got a long way to go. The purpose of living according to these principles established is to, is to help the grace of God to appear to all men. Again, I say, imagine if the aged men and the aged women and the young men and the young women and the employees and the employers, what if we lived according to even these principles outlined in Titus chapter 2? Might I say, our homes would be blessed, our jobs would be blessed, would they not? And somebody would say, wow, Brother Nick, you've been in Tennessee for a while, so I haven't been able to pick on you. But somebody would say, wow, how, how's all that stuff? Why is your life so much different than mine? Can we be honest for a moment? When they say, oh, it's because you're such a goody two-shoes. And many of us would say, no, it's not my goody two-shoes. You can give me four shoes. They're still not goody enough. <laughs> but it's the grace of God. Can we not acknowledge that? It's by God's grace. God has been so good to me. And so by our life, by our testimony, others would see the grace of God. And you know what they'd say? I want that grace too. It's a working grace. And here's what that grace of God, listen, as it's working in our lives, there's some things it ought to be doing. And, and as we see this grace of God, listen, it, it, it helps us to even identify those of the faith. And can I say, you and I need the grace of God, but there are folks around us that also need God's grace. So what does this grace of God do? Well, first of all, might I just remind you, you're saved by grace. You're saved by grace. For the grace of God uh, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Thank God, listen, that grace, again, hey, I had that machete and told you, listen, I brought it and, and, and I used it. By the way, it used to have a little strap on it and, 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 and a little string. And, and you know how many of us men, you're like, ah, oh, I don't need that string. What is that string? And we know that string was there. You're supposed to put your hand in it and grab it there. It kind of keeps it attached just in case it slips. It ain't going to slip. I was walking through that little thicket, and I was swinging, and I, and, I, and I hit something that was thinner than what I had expected. And as I went through it, the, the, the end of the weight of, of this machete took over, inertia took over, and that thing flipped out of my hand right into my shin. I felt like Lexi for a moment. I couldn't walk. Your ankle better? Okay, good. Hit me right, cut me right in the ankle. Thank God it was just a nick. Just a flesh wound. Be okay. Hey, sometimes we think, oh, I don't need it. But the grace of God hath appeared. Listen, it's not just grace that sits there. It's the grace that bringeth salvation. It bringeth salvation. Listen, can you just acknowledge this morning that by God's grace, he allows somebody to come to you and they brought with them God's gift of eternal life. They brought with them salvation and by God's grace, they extended it to you and by God's grace, you, you listen and you open your heart to pay attention to what's being said. By God's grace, as you listen and the, felt the prick of the Holy Spirit upon your heart, you received that gift. Hey, salvation is a term that we utilize that encompasses so much. And we don't have time to cover the entire doctrine of salvation. But can I just remind you, when we talk about being saved, we're talking about being cleansed from sin. Cleansed from sin. And listen, just so happens we sang about it. Not by the baptistry. Hey, not by mama's bathtub water. Hey, not by lye soap. 
Anybody have taken a bath in lye soap? Few of you have. I've only heard stories, and I don't want to try it. Hey, listen. Hey, but thank God. Listen, salvation was brought to me, and I was cleansed from my sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. By God's grace. Just consider even what, the, uh, uh, what John would say in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He didn't wash you in anything else, but by God's grace, he washed you in the blood of Christ. His blood. When I talk about salvation, that God's grace brought to you, we're talking about being cleansed. Imagine, if you will, you went to the restaurant, you sat down to eat, and they said, can I get you something to drink? And you said, ah, I'll, I'll just have a glass of water. Now, that water's clear. You can be able to see through the cup, and as you set, as they set that glass of water in front of you, you see through that clear water and you're like, wait a minute, there's something in there. And you look at it and you begin to see there's like a chunk of something on the other side of the cup, on the inside. As you see that chunk, you begin to examine the glass a little bit more closely because now something caught your eye and, 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 and you see that shade of lipstick that you don't wear because you're a dude. And it's all over the edge of the cup. And you're like, it's got lipstick on it. I don't wear that stuff. The only lipstick I wear is when my wife puts it on me. Because she done gave me a kiss. Right? Hey, listen. Oh, listen. I have a license. Amen. And thank God for that. And it's right in the sight of God. Hey, listen. As you consider that, you're like, there's lipstick on it. There's a, and you begin to examine it a little bit more closely. You're like, there's lipstick and there's a chunk on my glass. And I don't even know what that is. And you ever notice that sometimes we see something like that and you don't know what it is and we begin to scrape at it? <laughs> Why do we want to touch it? It's nasty. It's dirty. You don't want to drink it, but you want to touch it. And then you use your hands that you didn't clean to pick up your food. Think about it. Am I right? David, I'm right. You work in a restaurant business? Yeah. You ever see somebody do that? Like, oh, it's nasty. And they're like scraping at it. And then later on, they're chewing on their fingernail. You're like, so why didn't you drink from the cup? <laughs> you begin to look in the ice cube and there's something in the ice. There's a, there's so, and it's, it's dark. You're like, there's a bug in the ice. As you begin to look at that, the more closely you examine your glass and the more clearly you can see things, the more you're like, I am not, I am not partaking of this cup. And the, the waiter comes by and can I get you anything? And you say, yeah. Can I have a different glass and some clean ice and something preferably without lipstick? <laughs> right? How many of you want to use a dirty cup? And you understand, listen, when God looks at you and I, he doesn't see a chunk of food. He doesn't see lipstick on there. He doesn't see a fly that, that's, that's stuck in the, in the ointment, if you will. He sees our wickedness and our sin. And a holy God, as he looks at you and me, he has every right to say, that is disgusting, that is wretched, that is wicked. I want to have nothing to do with that. But by God's grace, cleanse from your sins, and now he sees you clean. Amen. Not only cleansed by the blood of Christ, listen, this salvation that we're saved by grace, by, uh, uh, what we're talking about, but then delivered eternally from the penalty of sin. Aren't you glad by God's grace, salvation's forever? My, so there are some that teach, you know, since salvation, God made the down payment for it on the cross of Calvary, and his blood was sufficient enough to save you if you but continue to stay in the faith and don't fall from his grace. Have you ever fallen from God's grace? In, in other words, have you ever done something you shouldn't have done after acknowledging it was not right? <laughs> Last week? Last night? When you walked in the church? Hello. 
you imagine if you had to upkeep the payments for your salvation? You know, one of the joys of financing something, at least there's a final payoff date. And how many times do you count down the days? 60 months. At first, the first day you sign it, you're like, yes, I can do that. 60 months. Like in the month 58, you're like, oh my soul, how long is 60 months? Right? And then you get into buying a house. And you're like, how many years? I'd rather have 60 months. Wait a minute. Think about this for a moment. If you had to upkeep the payments for your salvation, you and I would be lost. It's an eternal salvation. Hey, listen, for the wages of sin is what again? Death. Death. But the gift of God is eternal life. What kind of life? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen, it's an eternal gift. And thank God we have the promises. Like Jesus would speak from his own mouth. He said in John 10, 27, my sheep hear, hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. Father's hand. Think with me for just a moment. Jesus said, listen, when you got saved, you were placed in his hand, and he kind of held you right there. You're nice and safe. Nobody can get you out. And then just to make it even more eternally secure, he put his hand inside the Father's hand, if you will, and he says, listen, in order to get to you and remove your salvation, they got to go through the Father, through the Son, to get to you. Hold on. Well, pastor, don't you know that he said no man can pluck, but it doesn't mean you can't get out if you don't want out. Last time I checked, he said no man can pluck them out. Guess what? I am just a man. For I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever, Solomon said. Nothing can be put to it, neither taken from it, that men should fear before him in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and verse 14. If it was God that saved you, then it's God that keeps you saved. I'm glad I don't have to keep me saved. By God's grace are you saved. What does that mean? Just in a nutshell, cleansed of all your sin and delivered eternally from the penalty of sin. Hey, listen, not only death, uh, speaking of the, 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 the sting of death of this life, but how about hell as we talk about that in Sunday school? As we begin to talk about the subject of hell, I wonder, do you realize what you were saved from? I'll never test the waters of hell, if you will. I'll never smell the smoke, the stench. I'll never get close enough to feel the warmth of the flames. I'll never have to listen to the shrieks and the crying and the wailing of those in an eternal hell. Unless you've watched too many cartoons or too much of Hollywood's depiction of hell, there, listen, there is no little devil in hell stirring his little cauldron laughing because that's his own little kingdom. My friend, he will be there in torment day and night forever and ever, the Bible says. He will suffer in hell as anyone else. He is not the king of hell. He is not the God of hell. Hell is his place of eternal judgment. And I'll never have to go there because of God's grace. And as if that was not enough, I was saved by grace, but this grace is a working grace. Though salvation is now complete, God's grace is not. Number two, now we ought to be taught by grace. Look at verse 12. Teaching us. You see those two words there? teaching us. But look backwards just a little bit. I try to challenge you as you read your Bible, pay attention to sentence structure. I know it's grammar. We hate it. I can't stand it. I don't like it. I don't care if it's an adverb. I don't care if it ends in L-Y. I don't care if it's a participle, present participle, past participle. I, 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 don't, I don't, but you know what? If I didn't know anything like that, I wouldn't be able to understand that which way I read. Well, verse 11, do you see the end of verse 11? What's at the verse, end of verse 11? One of you teenage girls, help me. What's at the end of verse 11? 
There's a teenage girl back here. Okay, comma. Hey, one of you girls now. What's at the end of verse 11? Comma. There you go. Thank you. And the, you know what that means? The sentence is continuing. Notice, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. What's the subject so far of our sentence? What are we talking about? Grace, right? This grace is teaching us. We ought to be taught by grace. Teaching us. Well, you know what? Pastor, I'm learning so much by God's grace. Well, you know what? God tells you some of the things that ought to be teaching you. Hey, it teaches us, hey, some of the aspects of Christian living, if you will. Teaching us that, notice first, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. That's the negative side, if you will, of Christian living. We ought to be denying some things in our life. Pastor, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and now whatever I choose to do in life is all up to me. God's grace teaches you otherwise. God's grace teaches you, listen, by God's, follow me here for a moment. By God's grace, I learned about salvation. Hey, by God's grace, it ought to be teaching me. There's some things you don't need to be doing. And by God's grace, you'll pay attention and not do them. Hmm. What happens to a person when they reject God's grace for salvation? They spend an eternity now. I wonder what happens when we reject God's, uh, excuse me, reject God's grace when he's trying to teach you what not to do. You may not go through eternal judgment, but I wonder if you'll go through a temporal judgment here on this life. Consider some things that we're to leave alone. Ungodliness. Denying ungodliness. Hey, listen, those are things that are not bringing glory to God. What does the Scripture teach us in 1 Corinthians 10, 31? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Might I say there's a lot of things in Christendom today that we think are okay that bring no glory to God. As a matter of fact, I would say some of the things that we involve ourselves with remove glory from God. What did Jesus say? Herein is my Father glorified. Audrey, you know, he said that John chapter 15, when he talks, I am the vine, you are the branches, right? Talking about abiding me. And in that chapter, he says, herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So he wants you to go plant a, a, a garden and he wants you to grow grapes and apples and oranges. Oh, you want your dad to do it. No, no, that ye bear much fruit. You're supposed to do it, right? Is that what he's talking about? Here is my father. Uh, Cain would have said, Seriously? Seriously, I had fruit. He rejected because that's not the kind of fruit he's looking for. You know what he's looking for? We're to produce other Christians. That's how we glorify him. And listen, everything we do ought to help bring people to Christ. You know, some of the things that we say, some of the things we do, some of the things we involve ourselves with doesn't help bring people to Christ but pushes people further away from Christ. Well, pastor, wait a minute. I had every right to. I'm trying to help you. Paul said all things are lawful unto me. I've got every right to, but not all things are expedient. You may have the right to, it doesn't make it right. Denying ungodliness. Is there a chance maybe our flesh doesn't want to deny ungodliness but wants to accept it? By God's grace, you ought to be taught that it's ungodly and you ought to reject it. Hey, not only are we supposed to die, deny ungodliness, we ought to deny worldly lusts. Is that what he says? But what is that? Those lusts, hey, those are the things that are, uh, listen, we crave after, hey, the world teaches you what you ought to crave and what you ought to desire. Let me, 
Let me help you just by way of a, a, an easily identifiable thing. Some of you here are a little bit older than me. Anybody here grew up in the 50s and the 60s? Got a few hands there. All right, you grew up in the 50s and 60s. Last I knew, in the 50s and 60s, listen, boys knew they were boys and girls knew they were boys. Some of you are not listening, right? Boys knew they were boys and girls knew they were girls. Okay, just want to make sure. And so, trying to catch you on. If you're not listening, you missed that, right? Hey, listen, nobody questioned and said, hey, I don't know what to, listen, in the 50s and 60s, how many people from your generation would say, and it's kind of interesting, most of them are over here, and uh, Brother Gordon, did you grow up in the 50s? You didn't grow up in the 50s, it was, that's before your time, right? Okay, so just want to make sure, I didn't want to leave you out, but all of them are on this side, okay. So, I'm just going to have to preach to this congregation over here for a moment. Hey, listen, in the 50s and 60s, when, when, when you, uh, and listen, just using some modern things that society today is so confused on, when you had to find a restroom, did you stand there and think, I don't know which one to go to? No, boys went to boys, girls went to girls. By the way, we didn't say it doesn't matter how you identify. You know what I identified? I identified as what I am. Well, I don't have brown eyes today. I, my eyes identify as green eyes. I don't care what you think they identify as. They're still brown. Right? There was no question. Hey, how many of you, some of us, we grew up in the 70s and the 80s. Right? Now, listen, 70s and 80s, I remember some people, hey, they knew what they were, but they wanted to act like the other. But they knew what they were. They just wanted to act like the other. Girls wanted to act like boys, and boys wanted to act like girls, though they knew that what they were. Now we're in a time, it's not just acting like each other. Hey, we don't know what we are. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. In the, help me out, previous generation, over 50s and 60s, if somebody would have come to you and said, I don't know if I'm a girl or a boy. <laughs> right? No, wait, fo follow me here. 70s and 80s. Then he said, I don't know what we are. Hey, you go to the 90s and the 2000s. Some, oh, you've got to have compassion on them. You, you're just not tolerant. You just don't care about people. You know what this world, if you pay attention, the world is changing and teaching you what you ought to think and teaching you what you ought to desire. Guess what? You know what lusts are? You desiring something you shouldn't have. And if the world is teaching you what you ought to think, worldly lust is the world teaching you things that you ought not have that you now want because the world taught it to you. And the scripture says we ought to be denied. I wonder if there are things in Christendom that Christians desire and want because of the influence of the world and not because of the influence of God. Hello? If Paul the Apostle could come to our churches today and stand up and preach in our churches today, I wonder what he would think about our average church service in America, this quote-unquote Christian nation. I kind of think, Brother Seifert, I kind of think if he started preaching, folks would leave. They'd walk out. Well, I, don't, I don't need that kind of preaching around here. If John, the apostle, the beloved, right, the one who leaned upon Jesus, when he wanted to come to the church, hey, Diotrephes says, no, nah, he wanted the preeminence. I don't want John here. Why? Because everybody lifts John up because he's the apostle. He's the beloved. And, and, and here, he, he, felt, he felt as though uh, uh, he was attacked if John would show up. And he wanted the preeminence. Rejected John the apostle. If John called me today and said, Pastor Graf, can I come to your church? Now, it's not going to happen, okay? But if he did, I'd say, come on down. Tell, can you preach to us the book of Revelation? I don't want some man. I want you who saw it. You tell me what you saw. You open it up. But hey, if you don't have time for that, third John's okay. Right? Hey, if John came to our church, I wonder what he would think. How about this? If Jesus walked into our churches today, what would he think? 
this world has influenced our churches more than our churches have influenced this world. You do understand, Pastor. <laughs> a church service that lasts past noon will never work. Is that not what the world teaches? Huh. But also teaches us, listen, the positive side of Christian living, not just the negative side, things we ought to deny, but what we ought to be doing, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. That's how our lifestyle, listen, that, that's dealing with us and how we live. That's our life in the sight of God. Imagine Colossians chapter 3 where the scripture says, We ought to mortify therefore our members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye uh, also put off the, all these. And listen, not just the, uh, the, the wicked things that our minds begin to go to and say, well, I don't do those things. How about this? He says, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Listen, how we live our lives even in the sight of God, when nobody else knows about it, hey, it's internal, it's, it's only in my heart. Yeah, listen, if it's in your heart, eventually it's going to come out. We ought to live not only soberly but righteously. Listen, in our life, how our life, or how our relationships with other or fellow men, listen, in the sight of man, how are we living? Are we living righteously? Consider Romans 12, 17, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give peace. Uh, uh, give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if mine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Listen, we are very unrighteous in our living because we walk around with such a piousness about us and act like we're so holy and hold so much anger and malice and envy and disregard for other mankind. Listen, that is not what God said for us to live. That is not how he said to live. Listen, the positive side of our Christian life, we ought to live righteously. This is positive preaching right here. Even like where he says there, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. A lot of the things that we do that is so, such, it's just disgusting the way Christians react one to another. We use the retort as though we are defending the faith. No, you're defending you. And the scripture says, let God take care of all that. Let God take care of all that. Hey, what the Bible declares is not going to fall down if I don't stand up and be nasty about it to others. Hey, Recompense, what did you say? Uh, recompense to no man evil for evil. Well, I'm going to fight fire with fire. Grace teaches us we ought to be living soberly, righteously, godly. That relationship with God. He says in Colossians 3.15, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. This ought to be a daily thing. We shouldn't just be living godly or, or have a relationship with God only on Sunday. What happens on Monday when you show up to work and all out of the blue you begin singing like, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Right? What happens if you show up? I, I, I challenged teenagers one time, go, th go through your public school hallway singing Jesus loves me. Try it. 
You know, people think you're crazy out of your mind. Wait a minute, we ought to be living godly lives in such a way that, listen, our relationship with God penetrates into every day where we can let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, that's abundantly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, listen, singing to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. God's grace is a working grace, for it saves us, then it ought to teach us, and lastly this morning, it ought to mark us. What do you mean by that? Well, look at verse 13. Just because we talked about grammar, verse 12 ends in a semicolon, so the thought is continuing. Looking for that blessed hope. Because the grace of God hath appeared to all men, hey, it's appeared to me, it saved me, and it taught me, now I ought to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. It, pastor, if I'm one of those that, that, that stand there looking to the east as though he's really coming back, you know how many people are going to identify me as crazy? You've just been marked. Hey, let me, let me just... Amusing for a moment, okay? I remember as a kid, I, I didn't know anything about church. I didn't know anything about God. I didn't know anything about the Bible. If you'd asked me what the second coming was, I said, well, what's the first coming? I, I knew nothing. And I would see those uh, on, on Hollywood's TV shows when they would ridicule the Christian, and he would sit out there with his little sandwich box sign, right? And, and the end is near. He's, you know, judgment is coming. Prepare to meet thy God. And how many times do you ever see them? And, and I always thought they were like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or something like that. And Hollywood we would laugh at those individuals. Wait a minute, so much so that we as Christians are afraid to declare, He's coming. He's coming. And if you're one of those that allows the grace of God to save you and to teach you in so much that it would cause you to be looking for the coming of your Savior, changing your life completely. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be marked. The world's going to say to you, oh, <laughs> you're one of those. Yeah. You ever had somebody kind of talk to you like that? Oh, I, I figured that's, yeah, it makes sense now. Our kids, as they enter in the workforce, they're kind of growing up, you know, become, becoming. I didn't say are, because in a, child, in a parent's mind, they never really are, I guess, right? Becoming adults. And, and how many times, listen, somebody on the job would say, do your parents let you do anything? Right? Do they let you do anything? Trey's about like me. I can almost see him responding. I think he has a few times. No, they lock me in a box when I get home, and, and they only let me out to come to work. Yeah, there are some people that do that then, so yeah, you got to be careful. <laughs> Had somebody asked me one time, do you do anything for fun? No. I don't like fun. I'm thinking, how does anybody who works with me and, and, and is around me 40, 60, 70 hours a day ask me if I do anything for fun? I hate laughing. Don't smile. It's not funny. It's ungodly. Put your teeth away. The world, they mark you because you're not like them. No, wait a minute. <laughs> Look what he said. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. Jesus Christ is coming back. And listen, the grace of God is going to cause us to look for him. Did not Jesus say, in my Father's house are many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. You remember as John uh, wrote those words down in John 14, Thomas is like, Lord, we don't even know where you're going, and so how do we know how to get there? Verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me, he said. Wait a minute. Jesus, you left to build a, a place for me, a mansion? 
and you're coming back? Oh, yeah. That's why Paul would remind those at Thessalonica, listen, we don't have time to go through it all, but remember 1 Thessalonians 4 when he talks about what we call the rapture, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant as others are who, which, don't, uh, which have no hope. When he talked about the voice of God and the shout of the archangel, or the, excuse me, the trump of God, the shout of the archangel, hey, the dead in Christ rising first, those of us alive or remain caught up together with them in the clouds. When he says, comfort one another with these words, he said, don't live like those who don't have hope. Wait a minute. You mean, Pastor, <laughs> the grace of God puts so much of a hope in me that I can walk in life with a pep in my step, a smile on my face, a song in my heart, and with an eye towards the eastern sky as though my Savior's coming back today? People are going to think I'm nuts. You've just been marked. When God, when the grace of God marks us, identifies us because we're looking for our Savior, it's going to cause us to be a peculiar people. Is that kind of what he talks about here? might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be weird because you wear square hats and pointed shoes and only this color and, and, and you're scared of electricity. And... No, what's peculiar? You're going to stand out. <laughs> Those who live for God tend to stand out. They stand out in a crowd. But not just to be peculiar for peculiar, peculiarity's sake. Let me get the word out. But he says peculiar, a peculiar people, look, zealous unto good works. We're going to, be, we're going to stand out in such a way that it's going to cause us to desire to live differently. Not just be different as in general sense, but completely live differently. Remember, as we talked about at the beginning, Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Most Baptists put a period right there and forget the rest of Ephesians chapter 2. But how about verse 10, the very next verse? For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. His workmanship. I don't have anything special here, but you ever seen somebody make something and you're like, they're like, hey, I made this. You're like, whoa, you made that? That is so cool. How'd you do that? Oh, the uh, it's so intricate. Intricate, yeah, that word. It's so intricate and it's so amazing and, and it's so, how did you, how many hours? And you're just amazed at how much effort. We, you are the workmanship of God. And listen, there are some that ought to kind of come to us and go, oh, Lord, you, you made this? Not, 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 not in it. You made that? <laughs> Well, Lord, I thought you were better than that. No, no, not that kind. You're his workmanship. Listen, our life, when we live zealous unto good works, hey, listen, you're his workmanship created unto good works. The works that you do and the things that you do ought to be so that folks, listen, they identify, wow, God made that, made you. Look what you've accomplished in the name of Christ, for the glory of Christ. Oh, man will build, build big buildings and massive bridges and, uh, and, and do things with uh, great wonders. And listen, nothing compares to the workmanship of God in the life of a Christian, which he hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Just imagine our life if God's grace would have its uh, would, would would have its full working done in our life. Imagine what we could be taught. See, salvation was a complete experience. You got saved. You got all saved. 
But imagine if God's grace had not only saved by grace, imagine if you got all taught. Now just appease me for a moment, okay? I know the grammar stuff, okay? But imagine if you got all taught. You learned everything that God's grace is trying to teach you. And imagine if you were all marked. What do you mean all marked? You, you were looking unto Jesus and you really believed he's coming back. And you lived your life accordingly. Imagine what the church would do in our area. See, God's grace, people go, ah, by God's grace, by God's grace. Well, what's God's grace doing in your life today? Well, pastor, I don't need to learn anything. Really? Because I see a lot of things in just Titus chapter 2 by itself. It, hey, don't, don't get offended that all of us need. And that's just one chapter. Let me add a few more chapters to Titus chapter 2. There you go. I wonder if there's anything in there that we might need. I wonder. Listen as God's trying to mark us and strengthen us to be different. I wonder if this world needs that. The Lord's coming back soon. The Bible says that His grace, the grace of God hath appeared unto all men. Let me just close with this. Might I say oft times that grace is identified in you. So if it's not in you, who's missing out? Lord, we thank you for the day you've given us. We're so grateful for your grace. Lord, we're grateful that we are saved by grace. But as we think about your grace, Lord, it ought to teach us some things. Teach us things not to do. Teach us some things to do. And Lord, it ought to identify us because we have trusted so in your grace that we ought to live differently than the rest of this world. And though they may mark us, they may call us out, they may consider us crazy, they may become bewildered, Lord, it ought not cause us to walk away from you. Lord, I ask your blessings upon this time of invitation. Maybe there's someone here this morning, Lord, they're saved but they haven't been learning the things they ought to be learning from your word. God, I pray you'd help us to allow your grace to teach us, teach us to deny, Lord, ungodliness and worldly lust, Lord, to be sober, to live righteously, Lord, to live godly lives. Not just learn facts and figures and statistics, but, Lord, how to actually live in such a way that we can glorify you. God, I pray your grace would mark us as we learn how to live, God, that we would do those things. Lord, that the day you come back, you would be pleased with our lives and that you might say, well done. Lord, help us to understand more about your grace today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. The piano plays.